my name is Shankar Garg and today I am going to talk about uh, behavior driven development in uh, mobile automation. So, you know, as uh, for the last 2-3 years we have been hearing a lot about uh, mobile automation, how we can integrate this in our new projects or existing projects. So that is why uh, me and my team have come up with 2-3 uh, you know, different tools, integration, and we have uh, come up with this whole uh, uh, you know, framework for automation. That is uh, you know, what I am going to talk about. So the agenda would be first I am going to define what the problem statement is, what should be the features of a test automation framework, with what is the tech stack we have used and why, then a little bit of uh, demo, and after that uh, you know, are we still missing something, what should be the final solution, and the second demo. That is what we are going to cover in this presentation. So this, the first slide is just to you know set the context right, that why quality is important. If I talk about 10 years back, then one customer bad experience you know, due to, was not a big deal for any organization, as it was you know just spread by mouth, right? It's not going to reach billions of people. But nowadays we are living in the age of Facebook and Twitter. So one customer bad experience leads to, you know, it spreads like fire. It, it reaches millions of people within seconds. So no one would like to you know, have a bad customer experience spreading on Twitter or Facebook. You know. and the second thing is app store ratings. If you are into mobile app business, be it Android, be it any platform, you have app store ratings. You really don't want any uh, you know, user coming to your uh, app on app store and giving you a bad rating. That is something like you know, stamping bad product on your packaging. You really wouldn't like that, right? So that is, uh, you know, this would be a make or break for your new app or for your new product. That is why you would like to have a quality of utmost important, you know, in, in these days. What is the current mobile landscape looks like? It's like, uh, you know, frequent app releases. There are multiple reasons why we are going through uh, frequent app releases. The first and the foremost one is ease of, uh, you know, updating apps over the air. There was a time when you used to get, you know, a, either a CD from the developer or the THC packages. You used to deploy it. It was whole, you know, five to ten minutes, at least five to ten minutes thing for upgrading, you know, a product. But now it is just clicking one button saying, you know, you have an update. Click on OK, and your app is updated to the latest version. So it's been that easy because you know it's that easy to update your apps. User expectations has increased, you know. For even for minor bug fixes, user expects newer versions very quickly. Like, and the third part is OS updates. Like in you know, in the last few weeks we have seen two major releases from two major uh, you know OS OSs, Android M and iOS 9. So in coming few weeks we will be seeing you know everyone every major app will be releasing newer updates for these OSs. So this is what the current mobile landscape is. So what this current mobile landscape you know, means for mobile test teams? So for mobile test team, it means you know, continuous headbanging, continuous uh, you know, testing, be it for newer releases, be it for newer versions, be it for newer hardware. They are you know, just faced with doing relation testing every now and then. That is what the challenge for mobile test teams is as of now. So the solution that comes to everyone's mind is, you know, let us shift from mobile, uh, you know, manual testing to mobile automation testing. So in uh, you know last two two and a half years, APM has gained a lot of uh, traction. It has solved many problems. It has gained high popularity. So it is you know the, cho the tool of choice for mobile automation teams. It helps you automate both Android and iOS and even you know, Firefox OS on simulators. And APM has enabled test teams to use the same test case on an Android and on iOS both. So you are saving your you know, at least 100% effort in developing a separate test case for a different platform. You can use the same test case on both the platforms. That is why APM has been you know, the tool of our choice. So we feel like you know we have found a solution. So it's an 
an API, it's a Selenium based open source tool. There's nothing from, uh, you know, nothing proprietary, nothing from JP as such. So how it, is it possible we are writing the test case for uh, iOS and it is working on for Android and iOS? So yeah. it's, so it's like, uh, you, have you used the Selenium for web automation? Or any, okay, so let me just give you, a, so once you deploy your app, everything is like, a, you know, an element for me. You know, either it's a button or a text or something. Be it iOS, be it uh, Android. So APM, how APM identifies elements is in form of, uh, let us say, buttons or something like that, right? Using the same locators which Selenium used. IDs, so your ID, it's, uh, let us say if you, same team is developing an app on Android and iOS for a button, if they give the same ID on both of them, so I can you know use the same ID to identify that button, irrespective of which platform I'm using. Or let us say if you're using the same locators for different platforms, I can have different uh, locators also. Depending on which platform I'm testing, I can use an if-else statement and switch it, switch the locator which APM uses for identifying the elements. That is how we can use it. So when, once it is deployed, if I have a dot .app, for iOS and dot .apk for Android, I can use the same test case for automating both Android and iOS. It really doesn't matter which platform it's going to. So even though we have IPM, it's feel like you know it's the solution, but still there are many problems you know still left if we talk about mobile automation frameworks. If we need to use mobile automation in our enterprise projects, you know which are going over many. Uh, many cycles or let us say you know, which are under continuous development for many years and are going to be under development for many years like you know your fashion app, your online retailers apps and everything they are going to be there for a long time so what you know we are still missing some parts so those some parts are APM is only for mobile automation you know, it, it enables you to automate but there are many things that are still left test automation framework like how do you you know, where, how does your reporting works? If you, you know, after a certain time, you want to see the reporting. APM doesn't give you reporting part, same as Selenium, you know, the predecessor of it. Maintainability, reusability. You know, th these two are, these two points are dependent on your, uh, let us say, your programming practices. Or how do you maintain and how do you build your framework? And the first and the foremost part is how do you define your test cases? That's also still missing, even though we have APM. And the next part that is still missing is, you know, behavior-driven development. With advent of agile practices, behavior-driven development has gained a lot of uh, traction. Right? Everyone wants to implement BDD in their uh, development cycles. So, how do you integrate BDD in your test automation frameworks? That is also still, you know, missing, even though we have APM. So here what I'm trying to do is, I'm just trying to list down the features that a test automation framework should have, so that you know it's very comprehensive. I'm not saying this is the whole list of things. All I'm trying to say is, this is, these are the features that I think should be there in any automation framework. The, if we want to incorporate BDD, the first and the foremost uh, functionality that our framework should have is, that non-technical people also can help in test automation. You know, we should enable them to give us requirements. The second point is requirements are directly converted into test cases. So that you know the dev and QA both are using the same perspective to read a requirement. If I have two different uh, you know, requirement documents for two people, let us say requirements design documents or the requirement documents from where devs you know understand their requirements. I have test case uh, documents from where QAs get their requirements. So there's always a chance that you know we may misinterpret some things differently in two different documents, depending on you know someone's writing style. So that is why we focus that you know one statement should be the requirement for both QA and for dev. Sorry. So the next is multiple OSs. If I'm into mobile app uh, you know testing, so like I have a manual test case with me. If I want to uh, test it on both the environments, so it is 200% effort for me. So if we want to reduce it, that's why we had, we thought, you know, let us do automation. 
But in automation itself, if again I have to write two test cases for two different platforms, then I'm not saving much of my effort. That is why it is essential that we use the same test case on both the platforms. So we need a tool which can support multiple OSs that I've already you know, talked about. Interportability, yeah, same test case, and multiple OSs is that it supports uh, multiple platforms as well. Next thing is maintainability and reusability. So maintainability, how easy it is to change a requirement. Like, you know, how easy it is to uh, change an existing test case in case, you know, let us say after a few cycles, if my requirements change, I need to change my test cases. So how it is, how easy it is for me to change. And reusability, how easy it is for me to extend the framework. That if I am writing new test cases, can I use the existing test cases and, you know, add new test cases without much effort. So these are the points that uh, you know, we should focus on, at least should focus on if I, we are developing a you know, test automation framework. So the solution is no tool alone is you know, capable enough for solving all these problems. What we need to do is we need to integrate two, three different tools so that uh, you know, we can solve all the problems or the, all the features that we have listed in the previous slide. So this is the tech stack uh, you know, that uh, I have chosen. The first one is Java, since I am you know, programming uh, you know, very comfortable with Java, that's why I have used Java. Since uh, ABM supports multiple languages, you can choose language of uh, your choice as well, .NET or C-Sharp. So all these tools are open source? Yeah, everything is open source. Then Maven, it's a you know build tool, and you can use add as well. But uh, it's just a you know choice of tools that I'm going ahead with. APM and uh, Cucumber. So APM, I've already talked a lot about you know why it is the uh, you know, the chosen tool here. So Cucumber, so Cucumber is basically for introducing uh, behavior driven development to our automation framework. GitHub and Jenkins, these are options. GitHub is just so that uh, you know if you want uh, multiple members or multiple teams to collaborate to your automation framework, you can use GitHub or at any other Git or SVN you know uh, client you want to use, you can use that as well. The next thing is Jenkins to introduce CI/CD pipeline to your project. How is APM different from Selenium? What are the advantages? Selenium. So Selenium is for web automation. APM is for mobile automation. So APM is also extending Selenium. Basically, the function that we are used to use earlier for web, now we are using them for, app, uh, for mobile. Plus, it also has some functions which are specific for mobile automation, like you know, two finger zoom, three finger zoom, touch. So those kind of things are already there. But it is built over Selenium itself. support your uh, mobile web also. You want to open a browser on your mobile, you want to see how your M dot website for, you can do that as well. So that, that is what we are going to cover in the next few slides. So moving on, so any more questions on text name? So you know some pointers that uh, you know why I chose uh, Cucumber for this one is Sukumba enables non-technical people also like your business analysts or your, your, your even your manual testers or your product owners to give us requirements in plain English following some little bit of syntax and we can use those statements as our test cases, directly as our test cases. Sukumba can be implemented in multiple languages, Java, Ruby, Scala or uh, you know uh, JavaScript. So whichever language you are more comfortable with, you can choose the uh, you know, that binding accordingly. Next comes Kukumba. It can be used for variety of uh, projects like mobile, enterprise, or web. You know, it is uh, platform agnostic. Kukumba doesn't have to do anything with which platform you want to develop your product for. The last thing is, as compared to other uh, you know behavior-driven development tools available as of now, it is comparatively easier to implement and to learn. That's why I have chosen Kukumba here. So why APM? I am again and again talking about why APM. 
just to list down that it can support multiple platforms. And to answer your question, it can support native web and hybrid applications all. So even though if, let us say, your mobile web or your, uh, let us say, native applications invoke web views and vice versa, APM can take care of that. APM can also be implemented in multiple languages. So whichever language you are more comfortable with, you, know, you are free to choose. So there were some other tools available for mobile automation earlier than APM, like Cell Android or something. So for the, using those tools, the disadvantages was that uh, you had to incorporate you know, one additional library into your uh, application school. So with APM, we don't have to do that. And with those tools, we were more dependent on uh, mobile app developers for you know different things that we needed for our automation. But with APM, we are you know we don't really need those help from the mobile app developers. And it can be integrated with many testing frameworks, JUnit, TestNG, and you know, Cucumber or JBehave, something like this. Earlier tools which were present, they were only you know they could be only integrated with JUnit. So that is why we have chosen APM here. Let us say framework. I'm going to open this app. I'm going to verify that if on the home page I can see these four different icons: <coughs> agenda, speakers, my schedule, and location. And if I click on any one of the you know icons, then I can you know see what's enlisted there. But I think uh, this app is not working. If I click on some of the options, I just keep on getting this. Please wait. Syncing application data. It's not moving ahead with that. So I'm reducing my test cases to just the two steps, not going with the with this step as of now. specify the workflow for agenda and speaker pages. This is, I am just mentioning what is the intent of this feature file, what I am going to you know, do in this feature file. This is what I am trying to you know, write here. Then you can see there are two scenarios here. So the scenarios are your test cases. So the first scenario here is I am trying to test the agenda functionality. The requirement says, given user is on application home page, I'm going again on my home screen. That is what a simple requirement looks like. And as of now, these reds are just uh, comments. So this is how a normal, you know, your scenario will look like. I have just commented those because the ne next part of that was not working. If we want to see how do we integrate, uh, you know, Cucumber and APM in our automation frameworks, so using Maven, this is how we add the dependencies. This is, a, this is the dependency for uh, Cucumber, where we just uh, need to mention Cucumber Java and Cucumber JUnit uh, you know, dependencies. And for APM, there is only one, APM Java client. Similarly, you can use anything for your choice of language. So now let us see how does uh, you know, the intermediate code of Cucumber looks like. The very first and foremost question that comes to anyone's mind is, like, how do these plain requirements, <coughs> you know, are translated? How does Cucumber framework identify that what does this particular English statement means? So that is where, it, you know, the concept of uh, step definitions comes into the picture. So this is how particular step definition looks like. So if you see these statements, which starts with given, and you know uh, this whole thing. And similarly with this, then so apart from the this piece of code, which I've mentioned here, everything else is generated by Cucumber. So we didn't need, to, need not to worry about generating this part of our code. What we need to do is we just need to mention the functions that are actually going to work. So earlier we used to use Selenium for it. Now we can use APM here. And this is how our APM code looks like. So what I'm doing here is, first of all, I'm trying to invoke APM. After that, the clear down function, 
and after that the functions that are more specific to the functionality that I'm going to test there. These are just the verify home page. So as you can see, if someone is experienced with Selenium earlier, so the statements and everything just looks similar to what Selenium used to do. These are some of the print statements that I have added here so that when we run this whole framework, we can see you know, how it's working. So these are all the functions that I'm going to use here. Let me just, uh, yeah. So there is one more, this hooks file. So like in uh, you know other frameworks we have before and after, here also we have before and after functionalities, which we can use to invoke certain pieces of functionality before our test cases start and after our test cases finish. So here we are just invoking the APM driver before our test cases start and we are, you know, closing the APM instance after our test case is finished. If, we, if I want to run it, what I just need to do is... Is it auto generated or we need to write this code? So this one hooks part. Yeah, we need to write it. It's not auto generated. So let me just try to see if one test case runs. I do not see any page again. I'm not sure if it's going to work because there is. Oh, so I think yeah, it's going to work. So ABM is just starting up. It is connecting with the emulator in the background, and you can see it opened the app. So it's going to wait for this, please wait this pop-up to go and verify what is there in the background and then exit. And on the right hand side of your screen you can see uh, APM is continuously interacting with the emulator and trying to get the latest information back. Yeah, so that is finished and you can see that just for the you know, demo purposes I had added some uh, print statements in my code. Get the feel that everything is working, I am just not uh, talking theoretically. So this thing is uh, done. So what we have done till now is like from the features that I have listed in the beginning, we have enabled, uh, you know, non-technical people can also help in uh, requirements. Slide is broken I believe. So the non-technical people can also help in uh, test automation and uh, you know, requirements are also getting directly converted into uh, our test cases. So I think there is some problem with the slide. But what I want to enlist here is my test case is working on multiple platforms and my test case is supporting multiple platforms. But still the problems that I can face is as the size of my project grows is this usability and there was one more uh, point in this slide, maintainability. So the problem in my code is the locators. Locators are, you know, are used to identify a particular element if I talk about test automation. So those are spread across my you know, Java file. So the problem is if someone wants to make a change to these locators, first of all he doesn't know that at which all places I have uh, you know, uh, spread my locators. So there is a chance that he makes a change to only few of the occurrences of that locator and he misses some of the locators. So one problem is that. Another problem is the scope. That for one feature, for one Java file, as of now I have all the code in one Java file itself. There is no scope defined for any file. So if someone wants to make a change, if someone wants to add new functionality, he doesn't know where should I go and what should I add. It could be the case that he wants to add a new function, but he is not able to find a new function and he just you know, duplicates it. So what is the solution? Solution is paid objects. So what paid objects does is it creates a DSL-like structure for our test cases. So now what we do is that instead of writing all the stuff in one particular Java file, we divide our 
uh, you know, our code as per the page basis. If I have three pages in my application, so I'm going to divide the whole code in three different pages. And for one particular page, I'm going to write only, you know, that page's behavior in that Java file. So some of the guidelines that we need to follow for page objects is that we need to define the scope of each page. That one page is equal to one Java file, and there I need to define all the locators for that particular page and all the behavior of that page. So that is how, and even though we define with all the locators and all the, let us say, behavior goes into one Java file, we still need to define what goes where. Normally the practice is that all the locators are on the upper side of the file, and all the behaviors are, you know, after the locators are defined. So that tomorrow, you don't need to, you know, juggle between your same Java file. Because this file can also grow a bit longer depending on what is the functionality of your, that particular page is. So just a little bit of demo here as well. I'm not going to uh, run the test case this time. All I'm going to show is, So this was the this was my file earlier which I was using for automation. So the first part was this whole part was just invoking and let us say killing the APM driver. And after that I was this was the function that I was using and the, these were spread across uh, you know all the pages. So if I you know convert this to a page object model, this is how I am you know using a separate class now for keeping the you know APM related code. Create driver and teardowns. So this is so this is my home page now. So as you can see, all the locators are defined here above. And after that, all the behavior of that page is defined below. Similarly for agenda page and let us say for speakers page. So this is how we have segregated the whole stuff into three different files. So the benefit of page objects is, the, the beauty here is, if you go through the files, you can see yourself that it is very easier to maintain them and to you know, extend them or to change them. So what we have achieved, like these requirements we have achieved earlier, and with the last part, maintainability and reusability. So if you introduce page objects into a test automation framework, so your maintainability and reusability will also be taken care till certain extent. That approach also, so this page objects have nothing to do with like how no, Page objects are something very intrinsic to the application itself. Right? So I'm that's what I'm saying. So even though if your projects are for six months, or let us say for one to two months, it's always better to use the best practices, right? Okay. You never know that the, you know when you're going to extend it. So let us say you don't use page objects for a one month project, and after two months suddenly someone asks you that we are going to you know extend that application. So now you again start with your project that was not page object based. So at that time, it will be difficult for you, you know, to understand what was there and you know how you make the change. Yeah, agree. But again, since uh, let's say the projects are multiple projects are going on now, now the same framework in the repository and that is being used by multiple QA persons or QA automation engineers, whatever you want. Yeah. And uh, so basically, if I use page objects, I'm just uh, this is a question. You know, I have this number of QAs in my team, and they all work. So what is the problem with this approach? I have not even understood. So it's going to take time, right? No, it really doesn't. So once you start following the practice, it is just about, you know, let us say if you have, it's as basic as if you see 10 pages in your application, just create plain 10 Java files in your page objects, start putting the stuff, you know, with, let us say for one page, you are currently working on one page, someone else is working on another page. So start putting in your stuff in different uh, files, that's it. I was just wondering if there is some. So that's what I'm saying. It is as simple as you see. You know, you have ten boxes. You see ten different pages. So whichever behavior and locator is there, start to pick it in different. Uh, 
Java files are different boxes. That is it. Even though if you have a smaller number of QAs, or let us say, you know, more number of QAs in your team, it's always easier to do that rather than everyone going to the same file. So that is what the problem I was talking about. You should have three QAs. So although you you know you have a very small team, everyone is sitting together. Still, no one knows really that you know how many uh, let us say functions you added to this particular file. So it could be the case that uh, down the line you have duplicacy in your code because all the three QAs added a piece of code. You know that was that is something that this problem will probably, probably be faced even by the concurrent developers. A uh, user story, let's say one user story is being uh, implemented by let's say an array of developers. So this problem would arise then also. So it's just a question of uh, how can I have the same framework, the framework so generic that it could be utilized mul across multiple applications with the minimum amount of effort involved in it. So that really depends. What do you define as minimum you know, effort requirement? No, that really depends. The, then it really comes down to it. Can we write this code in Objective-C or any other language? Yes, the so API Google Map both supports that. So you just need to use your uh, bindings uh, defined. Objective-C, you said? Yeah, yeah Objective-C. No, 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 not Objective-C. So that is uh, where the advantage of uh, this uh, you know, APM was that you don't need to learn Objective-C to write code for iOS automation. You don't need to learn Objective-C to write all this. So there is need to write the code on Java for, for, the, for uh, testing yeah. the iOS applications like iOS. Java, Ruby, or C-sharp, so those languages you need to Okay, and can, can, can we run this application on devices like? Yes, you can. On simulators, emulators, and on real devices both. And there is minimal effort required to run your test cases on real devices. Like earlier tools that were there, so there was a lot of work involved to run your test cases on real devices. For Android, you, like, you really don't need not to do anything. For iOS, you need to have that signed app deployed on your device. And it will work.